I just realized I wasn't um, recording the session. Um, it's being recorded now. All right. So for the first question, we'd ask us to use Slater's rules to calculate the effect of the nuclear charge for an extra place for potassium for its orbital. We find that the effective nuclear charge would be 2.2. So the next question is like, what happens if, what would be the effective nuclear charge if this electron now was in said place in the 3D orbital, right? So if we didn't have this weird thing where the force um, was filled before the 3D, what would happen then? And we carry out the same exercise, except in this case, or the configuration we're looking at would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and these are kind of special with Slater's rule, so we'll put 3d1 here instead. And we're basically trying to find um, the effect of nuclear charge of that electron in the 3d orbital. So same exercise before using the rule, so it's going to be, and but then because we get d orbital, the rule states that it's going to be everything times well, I should ask you, what's the answer that you got for this portion of it? What was your effective nuclear charge for the electron placed in the 3D orbital? Allison, Allison Williams, any answers? What'd you get for this part of it? Sorry about that. I just joined the session, so I was trying to get everything in, please. Okay, Allison just joined. All right, who else is in the other room? Um, how about David? Hey, David, David Core, do you have an answer for me? David is silent. Now, you want to take this one too? All right, Cleon says is the answer one. All right, David, apologies accepted. Yes, the answer is one because just like before, it would be Z star is equal to Z minus S is equal to 19 minus is equal to 18. Sorry, is equal to one. Okay. So from this, the next question asks us, so we've calculated the effective nuclear charge for an electron if it was for the valence electron potassium if it was placed, placed in the force orbital versus being placed in the one in the three orbital. And we see that if it's placed in the force orbital, then the effective nuclear charge is higher. Um, it, this, this is for the high effective nuclear charge and if it was in the 3D orbital. What does this tell us then or help us to rationalize with the ground electron configuration for potassium, All right? Does this help us to understand why, when we write the electron configuration for potassium, we go from 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6 to, to 4s1? No, the slide hasn't been changed. Um, we're still using the same slide. Right? So how does this value help us to rationalize? So again, if we look at Z effects or the effective nuclear charge, in the forest, we've got 2.2. And if we look at it in the 3D, it's equal to one. So how does this help us now 
to rationalize the ground electron configuration of potassium. Anybody? Y'all going to let me just stand in this room like mad woman talking to myself? Georgina, you want to help me out? How about Samira Gale? All right, Georgina, no, you do not want to help me out. Luckily, I'm not drowning. All right. Nobody wants to help me out. Okay. It's going to be one of those sessions. I'll just give you guys answers and you guys will just um, sit here like sponges and absorb. All right. So what this is telling us is that when this valence electron is placed in the first orbital, it means it feels more of it feels more strongly attracted to the nucleus than one in the 3D. So therefore, putting this electron in the first orbital means there'll be lower in energy, and this would be a lower ground state configuration for potassium. So therefore, when we write the electron configuration of potassium, we always write it as Forest one, right? We don't fill the 3D orbitals, we fill the forest first before we fill the 3Ds. And as such, the 4S orbital is our valence electron. So if we want to write it out, we would write out that the values from the calculated. Effective nuclear charge indicates that an electron in the forest orbital is more strongly than one in the 3D orbital. Therefore, the forest orbital, or we can assume that the forest orbital is lower Is it only applied to potassium? We're going to now look at the next part of the question looking at manganese. All right. Is lower in energy. And the valent electron. Will be found. in this orbital in the ground state. All right, so there's my chicken scratch on um, the whiteboard. Writing on digitally is not as cool as it looks. All right, so Allison asked, Miss, does that only applies for potassium? 
And in this case, um, for remember now when we're filling up the, it also goes for um, we can use exercise if we look at the um, the 4D versus the um, sorry the 4S. Oh, sorry, the 5D versus. the 40 versus the 5S and so forth and so forth. Because when we look at the periodic table, once we finish filling up, once we fill up the noble gases, we go into the S block. And the reason for this is because the S orbitals tend to be lower in energy before you start filling up those D orbitals. But once we start filling up the D orbitals, what we see is that there's a switch now where the Ds are now lower in energy or the electrons placed in the orbitals are lower in energy than those in the forest. And that's the basis of the next question, which asks us to do basically the same exercise, but now we're going to do this exercise for manganese, right? A, a D block element and asks us to calculate effective nuclear charge for a forest electron and electron form the 3D orbital of manganese. And then based on this, how do we now um, assess um, the oxidation states of the transition metals? And the reason why I'm doing a lot of this is that during a high school, and if you look at even some of the Tyndale books, and even online, you'll find a lot of material you look at will list the, will, provide you with electron configuration D blocks and they will fill the 4S first. So you find argon, 4S2, 3D5 if we're looking for manganese. And when we're written this way, if you were to say, what is the oxidation state of manganese 3, the first thing you would do is that look at that electron configuration, say that the D electrons are valent, so I'm going to lose from that first. But when you do this, it gives you a false impression of the electron instructions of the transition metals. And when you go to calculate stuff um, like oxidation state and the electron count, which are very important in characterizing the uh, metals um, of the D block, then it doesn't, it's done incorrectly and it leads you astray. So I'm doing all of these exercises for us to basically to come to the same page that when we're looking at the D block, the S electrons are valence and they're not core, right? And by doing this exercise, we should be able to see it for ourselves or to rationalize um, why that is so. All right, so with that said, does anybody want to scribble on my slide or talk, tell us what the answer is for the next questions? If we were to carry out this exercise for manganese, What's the effective nuclear charge felt by a force electron um, in manganese? All right, I'll give you guys uh, three minutes. All right, Ricardo, forest equals to, oh, you got 6.5 new. Who helps? What did you get for your screening constant for S?
All right, so my class six point eight. All right, so I think there may be uh all right, let's work through this one together. All right, so for the four S, um for S, so let's write the let's write the first thing we do is just to write out the electronic configuration. And so that's going to be one is two. 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d5, 4s2. Uh, 18.5. So s for the 4 is 21.4. And that effect should be 3.6. So let's see um, where <laughs> it's all right. That's why we have these sessions. Um, let's see where um, where we are um, going off course. Okay, so does everybody get this? So are we on the same page for the electron configuration? 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. 3p6, 3d5, 4s2. Okay, so if we're going to look at it from the forest perspective, right? So first thing is that we know that, so for electrons in the same orbitals, it's going to have a 0.35. Um, yeah, it's going to have a 0.35 contribution. So we know that's going to be one, there's only one of them. It's gonna be one times 0.35. Right. And then we're going to look everything minus one from that is going to be 0 0.85. And so we're going to have five plus six, 11, 12, 13. So 13 times 0 0.85. Right. And then everything else. Um, so n minus two is times one. And there are those 10 of those electrons, so it's going to be 10 times 1. And so therefore, from that, S is going to be equal to 21.4. All right, yes. If you leave out the D electrons in this, you'll be completely off because they do take up, they do make up a, quite a bit of for the shielding constant. So S is 21.4 in this instance. Um, and then from that, Z effective is going to be 25 minus 21.4, which should give us 3.6. All right. Are we all good with that? Okay, so now let's now do the same calculation, but this time we're going to do it for the 3D, right? Using the same arrangement, and then let me know what you guys get for um, Z, effective, Z effect for, um, for the electron in the 3D orbital.
3D equals 3.0. No. Remember now, this time the force is going to be higher in energy, so it won't consider the force in these calculations. Does that help? Five point six. Yep, yeah, that's the answer we're looking for. All right, Ricardo. Let's see. All right, three point six again. Okay. So, let's see. So, if we're now looking for the three D orbital, remember now if you're if they're looking electron looking in the D or the F, there are special rules for that, right? Where everything below them gets multiplied by one, right? So we have to be mindful of that. The second thing we have to be mindful of is that the 4s is higher in energy and using status rule, anything that's higher in energy, if something is higher in energy, then we don't consider them in our calculation. We just look for things that's lower in energy because we're using the caveat that core electrons are going to be, um, it's going to shield more effective than those that are, than the, the valence electrons are not going to be contributing to, to shielding. All right. So the answer is 5.6, and for S, in this case, S is going to be equal to, again, because of D, everything below the D orbital is going to be multiplied by one, and if we count them up, we'd have 18 electrons, that would be 18 times one. And then there are five, there are four other D electrons that have been multiplied by 0.35, so before times 0 0.35, All right? And so S is going to be equal to 19.4 in this instance. So therefore, Z effective is going to equal to 25 minus 19.4 which is going to leave us with a total of 5.60. All right, do we see that? All right, good, David. Okay, so again, here is now, but this time our values are switched because now if we look at this calculation, it's telling us that my electron, the 3D fields more nuclear pull than the one in the forest. And again, we're using one of the caveats we're one of the caveat we're making here is that the effective nuclear charge followed by the electron is also equal to the orbital energy. So therefore what we're assuming is that if the forest electron is feeling more pull from the nucleus, therefore it's going to be lower in energy. Or if the 3D electron is feeling more pull from the nucleus, therefore it's going to be lower in energy. And so using that, when we look at these results, we can clearly see that 5.6 is bigger than 3.6. So therefore, what's telling us is that the 3D electrons are going to feel more effective nuclear charge, more attraction to the nucleus, so therefore they're going to be lower in energy. And so if we were going to use, based off this, if we're going to write out the electron configuration for manganese, then it means that the 3D electrons should be placed first. And so when we write electron configuration for manganese, we write it as we write it as such. Um, so for manganese, it's going to be AR 3D first, 3D5, forest two. All right. So therefore, if we're going to ionize manganese and turn into manganese three plus. We know that our electrons, the first electrons that take off is from the 2s and then we take off one, wait, hold on. Sorry, it's two plus, my bad. I was like, is my question wrong? But I realized that. It should be two plus and not three plus. Sorry about that. That those two electrons are gonna come from the forest 
and that's going to leave us with manganese 3D5. And that's the correct electron configuration for manganese 2 plus. Okay, are we good with this? Any questions or can we move on? Okay, great. All right, so provide electron config. So next question is just asking us, we've just done the exercise. Can you provide electron configurations for the following elements and ions? So this should be, we can probably go through this very quickly. Um, who wants to tell me what the electron configuration for titanium is? And you can use um, short, um, shorthand noble gas configuration notation. Dante, want to give me an answer? AR four S two three D two. AR. So Dante, remember what you said while we're going on. What would we say about the relative energy of the four S and the three D orbitals? Three D two four S two. Awesome. So for titanium. Is going to be AR three D two four S two. Thank you. Brilliant. All right. How about the next one? Vanadium four plus. Mia, how are we doing? Mia wants to give me an answer. Mia is going to be silent. All right, let's work our way down the list. Miss Garland, would you like to give me the electron configuration for vanadium 4 plus? Oh, Mia is answering in the. All right. Okay. So for vanadium, the for vanadium atom, it will be argon 3D342. But if we're forming the four plus ion, it means that we would remove four electrons, and as such, it would be Ar3D1. Okay. <laughs> all right, Mia, just make sure that when you have a test, you don't forget to remove those electrons, all right? It's going to be very important. All right, how about copper? <laughs> um, AR3D10 for S1, exactly. Copper is one of those weird ones. And then the last one is manganese 3 plus. And you guys are like, where is where does someone keep asking us for electron configuration? And as we start going into crystal field theory or calculus box station state, you'll realize why we keep I keep asking you guys for electron configuration and for manganese three plus Naja, remember that we're moving electrons. All right, it should be AR three D four. All right, great. So we're good with this. All right, so now here's a part where I really want you guys to be able to draw on my slides, on my whiteboards for the next question. Let's really get into it now. So for question three, you're provided with five different um, compounds and you're asked to draw them out, um, to name the shape. Um, the oxidation state, uh, coordination number, and the D electron count, right? 
So who wants to tackle the first one? Anybody want to try drawing on the on the slide? Yikes. All right. That's a no, not the response I was looking for. All right. How about you guys like <laughs> miss you the first one? Okay, how about you guys tell me what the ligand is around nickel in the first one? Write that out and I'll draw it for you guys. All right, C204, and what's the name of that ligand? And you guys have worked with this ligand before. What's the name of it? Oxalate, right. And what kind of ligand is oxalate? Is oxalate going to be anionic or neutral? And is it a monodentate or a bidentate ligand? It's a dianion. Good job, Mia. And it's a dianion. That means what kind of what um how would it bind the metal center? In monodentate, bidentate, bidentate. Correct, David. So we should remember that oxalate looks like this. Right? So it's going to be a uh, dianion, it's going to bind them in a, in a bidentate fashion. So for the first one, we have nickel. So the first thing to note is that it's sodium four, which means that the sodium is a cation, which means that my complex ion, my complex ion is going to be an anion. It's going to be negatively charged, right? So as I draw this out, it's going to be, I'm going to have four sodium counterions, and I'm going to have a nickel. The first thing I normally do is to just draw out what my octahedral arrangement is going to be. And we should probably talk about how we knew it's octahedral first. First, okay. So it's bidentate, and there's three of them, which means that it's going to be the coronation number is going to be equal to six, because each one of these will take up will take up two um, sites on the ligand, so therefore my coordination number and as such, I will have an octahedral complex. All right, so then the next thing that I like to do is to then draw in my oxygens and then my carbon bridges. Um, bear with me as I try to Manipulate this. So I'll draw my carbon bridges in, then draw my carbonyls. Maybe I should have not put my brackets in yet. All right, I'm going to have four sodium ions here. Okay, so that's my complex. Did we all get something like that? I would assume, yes, all right, cool. Um, so now the next thing that we haven't done yet is to calculate the oxidation state. And so the oxidation state of my metal is going to equal the charge of the complex minus the charge of the ligand, right? The charge of the complex is going to be minus four. And we know this because we're counterbalancing with, because we do have, because we have, sorry, because we have four sodium ions, that means everything on the inside is minus four. So therefore, 
oxidation state. So is going to be equal to charge of complex minus charge on ligands. So therefore we know it's going to be equal to minus four minus now we have six we have um, three oxalate ligands and three of them. So, so each one of them is going to be minus one, it's going to be six. So it's going to be minus going to be four minus minus six, which is going to be equal to plus two. So for this complex, I'm going to have a nickel two plus. So it's going to be nickel two plus. And if it's nickel two plus, it means that my D electron count is going to be D8. Right? Are we good with that? All right, let's move on. So for the next one, uh, we have what? So for next, uh, what's the geometry of my cobalt complex? Tetrahedral. All right, so in the interest of time, I'm going to just run through these very quickly and then we'll move on to the next one. So it's going to be tetrahedrals, four coordinates. So, zero, one, two, Right, um, so it's going to be tetrahedral. My coordination number is four. And the oxidation state of cobalt is going to be equal to plus two. And it's going to be D7. All right, um, if this is still not getting there for you, there will be, I will post an answer key to this on Orvieli so you guys can look. Um, to, to check this out some more. But that would be this one here. Again, we have four anionic um, chloride ligands. Each one of them is minus one. And then the charge, because of two potassiums here, the charge overall complex is going to be minus two. So the oxidation state of the cobalt has to be plus two. Therefore, um, um, therefore, it's going to be a D7 complex. Okay, next one. The next one now has a variety of, so, so for C, we now have different types of ligands. So we have CO, EN2, NCSCL, and our contrarian is chloride. What's the geometry? for this cobalt complex. Jabari, do you want to tell what the geometry is for the complex in C? All right, I have a bunch of people saying tetrahedral. Do we have anyone, Jabari? <laughs> um, does anybody want to, fair enough, you're not sure. Does anybody want to offer another answer? All right, let's break it down. So the first ligand we have on this is EN, right? And what's EN? EN is going to be ethylene diamine, right? So therefore, EN
right? So therefore, it's going to be a bidentate ligand. So if En is a bidentate ligand, correct me, what would be, now do you want to consider what my tree is, right? So we have two bidentate ligands around it, which means that they'll occupy four binding sites. And we also have an NCS ligand, a chloride ligand, which means that we have six sites occupied, octahedral, correct. So again, if we were to draw this out, Um, I can put in my NH2 spores. Remember that these are just carbon bonds, NCS, and I can put in chloride. So I can make my, my cis structure. So therefore, this entire thing is going to be octahedral. And I'm going to have a chloride balance in it. And so my oxyto is going to be octahedral. Coordination number is going to be six. And the oxidation state of my cobalt in this molecule is going to be plus three. So therefore, I have a D6 complex. All right. So let's look at the other one. So again, um, for rhodium, we now have six monodentate ligands around it, which means I'm going to have again going to be octahedral. So rhodium. And then my thonch ion is going to be sulfate. So again, it's going to be octahedral. And my oxidation state of this complex is going to be rhodium-3. And it's going to be, what's my d-electron count? Rhodium is right under cobalt, so it's going to be D6. All right. So the last one is kind of challenging and kind of fun. Did anybody work out E? Or can anybody tell me what the geometry is around vanadium? How about Winthrop? Do you want to tell me what the geometry is around vanadium in well, the vanadium ACAC complex? Boom, Mia is on ball today, square pyramidal. Look at that. So, Mia, if it's square pyramidal, that means my coordination number is what? Not four, five. Right, for it to be square pyramidal, my coordination number has to be five. All right, so what does this look like? So we're gonna have vanadium. So first of all, what does ACAC -ac look like? Um, now ACAC -ac is, uh, sorry. ACAC is going to be a bidentate ligand, um, and it's going to have a charge of minus one. So, I'm 
is a minus charge there, where CH3 is here, and CH3 here, a methyl group here. And it's going to bind through the oxygens here. Right? So if I was supposed to draw, draw this complex out, again, vanadium will be in the center. I have an oxo ligand, and bear with me as I try to draw on the surface here. Binding through my oxygens. And it's going to be the oxygens, and it's going to be like almost like the whole pi system here is going to be um, bond, it's going to be partaking in the bond. All right, there's my CH methyl bridge here, it's right. So my, this part here is here, that's my CH, because now it's deprotonated here, it's attached here. These are my carbonyls, and they bond in that format. And when I have two of them, so there's gonna be another one here. And again, oxygen, oxygen. Right. And that's going to be my vanadium complex. So if we calculate the oxidation state of this, the this um, oxo is going to have a minus two charge. Each of the ACAC is going to be minus one. So therefore the overall charge of my ligands is going to be minus four. The oxidation starts, the oxidation, um, the charge of my complex is zero. There's no charge. Therefore, the oxidation state of vanadium is going to be equal to plus four. So it's going to be a D1 complex. All right, it's pretty good. Okay. I think that's the most challenging one of them. Um, so if you got it, good job. If not, just keep practicing. All right, the next question, and this one involves some more calculations. So for the next question, um, does anybody want to tell me how many chloride counter ions we had in this complex once you do the calculation? Does anybody want to turn their mic and provide an answer for me? All right, we're silent, so I'll just walk us through in um, the interest of time. So in the question, it tells us that, it gives us that a coronation compound of chromium contains six water molecules and three chord ions, and it gives us the formula mass. Um, so from this, I can write, so I know that I have CR with six water molecules, three chlorides, and I have a molecular mass, two hundred sixty-six four four grams per mole. All right, but I don't know how all of this is arranged. It then tells me that I add an excess of silver nitrate to 0.5 grams of this compound, and I measure a uh, 630 milligrams of silver chloride per precipitate. The question also goes on to tell me that only sil silver will only precipitate chloride conch ions to provide a structure for this chromium compound. So it's telling me that the only chlorides going to react with silver are those that's in the, that are conch ions, right? Okay, so therefore, how do I go about solving this? So the first thing I need to figure out is basically my mole ratio 
between the amount of silver of the chromium complex that is in 0.5 grams versus the amount of silver that actually reacted with the complex. So um, the first thing is how many moles of chromium is in that 0.5 grams? And so 0 0.5 grams of my chromium complex is going to have 0 0.5 grams divided by 266.44 grams per mole equals 0 0.0019 moles of complex was placed into the reaction. So then that number of moles produced how many moles of silver chloride? So number of moles of silver chloride right, is going to be equal to 638 milligrams, or 0 0.63. Uh, that's very ugly. That's one of the ugliest threes I've ever seen. Uh, nope, don't make this one. Divided by the molecular mass of silver, which is 143.32 grams per mole which is going to give us 0 0.00, 0 0.0045 moles of AgCl that was produced. So to find the mole ratio, it will be 0 0.0045 which would be equal to 2.36 or approximately two moles of chloride. Of chloride cone giants. So what this is telling me is that my complex, so if I had, so whatever I have on the inside, so my complex is going to have two chlorides right, on the outside, which means one chloride has to be around chromium, right? And then, therefore, all the other chlorides, right, one, And then I can only fit five waters around it. So therefore my other water is a water of crystallization. And that will be the structure or the proposed structure for the chloride compound based on the information that I have. Um, any questions on this? Did anybody get this? Um, I appreciate the honesty. We're going to see some more of this in today's lecture when we talk about isomers, right? Um, but basically, this again is just a mole calculation. So we know that the question tells us that silver will only precipitate with chloride ions. So therefore, when we do the mole ratio, there's two. It tells us there's two moles of chloride counter ions, which means there has to be two chloride counter ions on the outside, which means one chloride has to be bonded. Um, to the chromium complex. And so since one chloride is bonded, therefore I just fill up the rest of my occupation site with water molecules. Um, another test that you could do is that you could dehydrate this. So another part of the question could be that we add a dehydrating agent. And if this is the correct structure, then only one molecule of water will be removed once we dehydrate it, which would be the water of crystallization. So everything that's bonded to the chromium is going to stay bonded to the chromium. Right, and that way I could definitively then say that five of those water molecules are attached to chromium plus one chloride, which gives me an octahedral structure, and the other one serves a water of crystallization. Um, but don't worry, these will come again. Um, they tend to be more higher, a higher order question um, in terms of this. And this exercise is what was actually used 
to help determine what coronation complexes actually look like by Werner when he was challenging the main um, dogma at that time. All right, so the next thing is this part, this question here, and it's somewhat challenging. Um, and what I want you guys to look at is just to say that based off the knowledge you guys already have, you can look at any coronation compound and basically try to figure out something about its duxation state and its geometry and the d-electron count, which tells you a lot about these molecules. So for the first one, we have nickel carbonyl. And so if you look at this, um, you will see that if you look at the nickel center, you will see that in the nickel center, you have C oligons bonded to it, right? Right, you have CO ligands bonded to it. Right, so therefore, each one of those carbonyl ligands is going to be um, neutral, they won't carry a charge. So, therefore, we're going to have four of those. So, what we end up having here, so our ligand in this case is going to look like CO neutral ligands. We have four of them around, so therefore there'll be zero charge. So the charge in our complex here is going to be zero. The charge on our ligand is zero. Therefore, what we're going to have here is a nickel zero complex. So it's going to be D10. Did we all get that? And this is called nickel carbonyl. All right. What's the oxidation state for palladium in the second one? Go back to for carbon monoxide. Draw back, go back and draw the Lewis dot structure of um, carbon monoxide and, and calculate the formal charge, but it doesn't have a positive charge. It's CO, it's because of the electronics of the molecule. All right. So let's do the next one. Um, again, time is running out now, so I'll just do it. So if you ever come across a transition metal complex for which you really don't know what's going on or understand the bonding, one thing I want you guys to assume is that the metal ligand bond here, these, there's two electrons in this metal, metal ligand bond, and both of them are being provided to the metal center by the ligand. So if you were to take off this triphenylphosphine here, what we will end up with is a phosphorus with two electrons and three final rings around it, All right? This triphenylphosphine, which you guys use in your Wittig reactions when you're doing organic chemistry, and therefore it's neutral. So this triphenylphosphine here would be neutral. And then you have a chloride which would be anionic. So therefore, you'll have two neutral ion, two neutral ligands, so zero and zero, and you'll have two anionic ligands, and the overall complex is neutral. So therefore, the charge on your palladium here is going to be palladium two, and it's going to be a D8 complex. The next complex here, um, zinc, the zinc complex, right? If you were to remove the ligands, 
we will see that the ligand that we have is glycinate so for basic from um, glycine the amino acids those of you taking um vitamins that has zinc glycinate in there um this is what it will look like and what um so if we break this apart again we're going to give two electrons to the nitrogen so we have h2 n with two electrons there we have a carbon chain next to a carbonyl and next that we have an oxygen and if we were to put two electrons on this oxygen we will end up with a negatively charged oxygen atom so this ligand is mixed where my nh2 is going to be neutral and my oxygen is going to be anionic and as such this is going to be zinc 2 and it's going to be a d10 complex All right and this one is pretty hard and I would be pretty impressed if you were able to figure this one out. So again, it's the same exercise as before. And what's required is that when we see something we don't know, is that we need to basically just look at this, the metal center itself. So it's a pretty hard one. And to see how the ligands are bonded to the metal. So in this one here, I just have to go what you really need to do is just to look straight at what's going on here. And we look and we investigate. We see that this nitrogen here, this one here, has three bonds around it, one, two, three. And that normally tells us a nitrogen with three bonds around it tends to be neutral, right? So it's going to, if we wanted to draw it out, apart from everything else, we can put it this way. That's going to be neutral. Look at the other nitrogen here. We see that, oh, look, there's only one, two bonds around it. So if we want to draw that out, we could do it this way. So this now is probably going to be here and here. We'll draw the Lewis structure. And this is going to be an ionic. Again, you wouldn't see something like this on a test at your stage. I just wanted to stretch you guys and to, to challenge you guys to look at these and not be afraid of them. And this is basically how iron sits into heme. Um, and, just, and this ligand here is called a porphyrin. It's called a porphyrin ligand. So if we continue our investigation, we look at the type of ligands we have on, we'll realize that we have another one of this neutral, right? This is the same thing as here. And then here, it's not the same thing, but again, we have another anionic ligand. So what we have is we have two of these, and then we have another nitrogen ligand, still with two bonds around it, but this time it's like that. Okay. So we now have a total of the charge on our ligand is going to be minus two. Let's see. Yep. And the overall complex is going to be zero charge. So therefore, I'm going to have Fe2 or Fe2 plus, and this is going to be a D6 complex. If you got that, pat yourself on the back. Um, good job. You really are mastering these ligand metal interaction complexes. Um, that's all I have for you guys. Jabari, don't lose hope. Again, this one was extremely challenging, what I said in the, as I said. Um, if you want to go into more details on this, um, you can set up an office hour with me and we can go through a little bit slower. No, this will not be on the exam. On, well, not this particular exam, but we did go through um, oxidation states and the electron count. So you'll probably get some simpler complexes that will be on the exam on Thursday. But again, you guys got this. You just need to practice. All right. Have a nice rest of your day. I'll see some of you see some of you later today for um, our continuation of our lecture on coordination complexes. Um, have a good one. Ciao.